Hello, everybody. All right, I'm in Fisher 208 on Friday, and uh, I'm recording this. I'm doing this before uh, not only the entire Pitt system, faculty are online, tape recording lectures, and using course web, but a lot of them don't until now, but other universities as well. So that's why I'm getting this done, so I don't, it doesn't crash or I have problems uploading. In any event, this is uh, NMR, <clears throat> lecture tape number three. We're going to work into C13 now. Okay, let me bring up the slides. Full screen, and we're underway. C13. Now, the natural abundance of the, uh, recall, there are three isotopes for carbon, 12, 13, and 14. 12, 13, and 14. The natural abundance of the carbon-13 is only 1.1%. So back in the 1970s, when I was getting my PhD, I was using heavily carbon-13, proton NMR, and N15. And the carbon-13, N15 work we were doing was pretty revolutionary at the time. I was too young to understand the significance of it. But we want to focus here on uh, carbon-13. Um, 1.1% natural abundance. Now, the signal to noise ratio back in the 1970s was a serious problem. Because the signal of C13 was so weak, you had to amplify it, and that was the beginning of Fourier transform signal to noise ratio. In fact, uh, many years ago, going back maybe 30 years ago, Dr. Hoffman, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, came down from the Medical Foundation of New York in Buffalo. He was a mathematician, PhD in math, and he felt Fourier transform leading to uh, so many different applications. So he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for that. He was a wonderful man. He's deceased now. Um, with the C13, you appreciate, all of you in here, you appreciate uh, the importance of data on carbon. And with the 1.1% Back in the 70s, you'd have to collect data over and over for hours. And nowadays, an undergrad could do this in a couple of minutes. Without C13, I don't know how the field would have progressed. And that would include, of course, uh, rational drug design and development, uh, structured determination of natural products. Anyway, the number of signals reflects the number of different kinds of carbon in a compound. And this is good news to us in this line of work. The overall intensity of the C13, and remember, you have to have an odd number, odd mass, in order to have uh, the uh, NMR. The overall intensity of a C13 signal is about 6,400 times less than the intensity of a proton signal. The chemical shift ranges also don't go from 0 to 10 or 0 to 9 on a proton field the shift ranges over 220 ppm. But that's a good thing. The reference compound, again, the internal reference is TMS. Okay, to help you guys get started, you know, you've had a year of organic. Many of you have had even more than that. So right away you can appreciate where our old friends are going to show up here from the early days of organic. Way downfield are your carbonyls carboxylic acid, amide, ester, anhydride, aldehyde, ketone. Carbonyls are down 150 to 200. Between 100 and 150, you have aromatic action and vinyl carbons. Between 50 and 100, triple bond carbons and CO ethers, right, alcohols. And uh, CN, CCL, CBR around 50. And then your SP3 actions between 0 and 50. Uh, in some cases, students learn C13 faster than proton. A case can be built for introducing C13 first. Here's a handy chart. Now, this is a type of chart that we're going to be able to begin to apply. And uh, what we see in the upper left is your TMS at set at zero, methyl, methylene, methines, quaternary carbons, steric compression causes these differences, actually. And uh, there is an equation 
we're not going to get into inherent structure determination. It's called the muller pritchard equation. And we can actually demonstrate orbital hybridization for carbons using C13 signals where the uh, parts per million chemical shifts occur. Uh, very interesting. <coughs> and you get into steric compression. C13 is a very, very valuable tool. There's your triple bond carbon. There's your nitriles, vinyls, imino, right? Shift base, lower left, 150, 170. Aromatic action, 110 to 170. Allergens, CNCO, amid, 165, 175. Ester, 165, 175. You know your infrared can tell you the difference between an amid and an ester. Carboxylic acid, 175, 185. Aldehyde, 190, 200. Ketone, 205, 220. Oh, yes, this is going to be very, very valuable. Here's a proton decoupled C13 spectrum of 2 butanol, and now we're looking at carbon signals. Now, this is proton decoupled. In other words, we're simply starting by getting the different number of carbons, the different environments. So we have community A, B, C, and D. A is a primary carbon, B is a primary carbon, but it's next to D, which is the secondary carbon with a CO bond. Then you have community C, which is a secondary carbon. So yeah, we're going to get four signals and there's your TMS. Now do you see those little uh, satellite peaks, they, we call them, uh, way down near 80, maybe around 78 to 80? That's due to the solvent, deuterated chloroform. There's a little bit of CHCl3 in there. And uh, that is not impurity. That is simply associated with the solvent they're using, in this case, uh, uh, chloroform. You'll see that a lot. No big deal for us right now. <clears throat> now here's the proton coupled C13 of 2-butanol. And this is valuable. Now you apply your N plus 1 rule to carbon. And there's the solvent identified down around 78, deuterated chloroform, a little bit of CHCl3. And I'm seeing a quartet, a quartet, a triplet, and a doublet. So now you can see you have two quartets of field, that would be A and B, and the one furthest down. Now remember, it's going from only a zero to 80. Down around 70, well, there's your D, the doublet, and it's a carbon deshielded by the oxygen, the electronegative oxygen. So it's absolutely beautiful. You, you get the signals first, then you can see how many hydrogens are bound to the different carbons, huh? The intensity of a signal is somewhat related to the number of carbons giving rise to it. Carbons that are not attached to hydrogens give very small signals, such as quaternary carbon C in this spectrum. Do not integrate C13s like we do with the uh, proton in the mark. It has to do with low-lying orbitals and, and heavy stuff. We're interested in structure determination in this course. Now, this is called the depth C13 NMR, and it distinguishes methyl, methylene, and methine groups. That looks like citronella aldehyde, and you can see CH3, CH2, CH, and then all carbons, proton decoupled. This is going to be very big with natural product structure determination. And you have a complex structure, and you begin to apply these NMR techniques. This is a cozy spectrum that will identify protons that are coupled. And there is uh, a vinyl, uh, a vinyl ether, and we're seeing A, B, C, D, and E, and there's your vinyls at 6.37, and this enables you to identify protons that are coupling with each other. This is a more advanced technique that's used in uh, natural products analysis. Cross peaks indicate pairs of protons that are coupled. 
Now, I'm not going to get into news, uh, uh, what is called the nuclear overhauser effect, NOE. Uh, I was involved in that in the 1970s. And when you have a complex structure, now let's talk confirmation. If you have a complex structure, you know that a particular confirmation may allow two non-bonded hydrogens to approach each other. Just like a protein polypeptide folding up, coming off of a ribosome with or without chaperone. Well, when two hydrogens in a particular conformation are converging on each other, you could have long range coupling and splitting. And you will actually see, uh, by zapping one, intensity of the one that's near it. So, cozy, depth, Nuclear overhauser effect are all advanced techniques. This is a cozy spectrum of one nitropropane, and uh, you're, you're seeing the coupling that's involved with these hydrogens, coupling and splitting. The het core spectrum of 2-methyl-3-pentanone indicates coupling between protons and the carbon to which they are attached. Indispensable in natural products analysis. C13 versus proton. I love the head core, uh, head core, and I think you would appreciate that immediately. And when you have large magnetic fields now, progressing from 220 all the way up to 800 megahertz, you're able to take compounds like cholesterol, where the hydrogens are all jammed in on top of each other and spread out those chemical shifts. Okay, here's an example of a C13, a practical, C5H9Br. Uh, and there are your signals. That's the solvent, down around 80. So this is proton decoupled. Here's C5HBr proton. You're going from uh, zero down to about four and a half. There's the infrared. No action to the left of 3,000. Saturated, of course. You can apply your ring index of hydrogen deficiency. And the answer is cyclopentyl bromide. C6H10O4. Apply the ring rule, the index of hydrogen deficiency. There's your C13. Ah, we got a carbonyl look. We are down around 180. Carbonyl action. Solvent. This particular solvent showing up around 40. Here's the proton. Here's the proton. Upfield and down at 11.97. Off scale. Carbonyl. Look at the symmetry of these sig signals in the NMR, proton NMR. Here's the infrared. Well, where is it? They didn't show it to us. Adipic acid. So uh, the symmetry, carboxylic acid, C13, carbonyl, all the way down there. Your infrared, which unfortunately they didn't show you, you would have had your broad, remember the bearded carbonyl? You would have had that broad OH on to the left or right of 3,000. That's it. You're done with uh, NMR, proton, C13. Please refer to the earlier uh, take lectures on proton and uh, coupling constants, N plus one rule, tree diagram. There's a lot there. And we're going to finish up the course now. We're going to give you some introductory mass specs. Some of you are experts in that. You're studying it right now with Dr. Mulcahy. And, uh, but some of you have not had the NMR, so we have to go over the fundamentals and assume that you don't know much about it, but if you have background in that, then put your time and effort into your infrared and particularly proton and C13 NMR. See you down the road, guys. Bye for now.